Jesus takes it a step further, and he says, any man who has lusted after his uh, lusted after another woman in his mind is guilty of adultery. Jesus, every that's everybody's what, going to hell. Everybody. Yeah, well, that's this is why Hitchens was so upset. You know, this is why he called uh, he called Jesus a celestial North Korea or heaven a celestial North Korea. You can be convicted of thought crimes. anything exciting no mostly yeah. i just stay at home dude <laughs> i watched boba well, fett saying, i finally started boba fett oh did you i watched two episodes um so good i have i have a rule though so like i've, I've broken my rule on it my rule is i'll give any show three episodes if, if if it doesn't get me in by the third episode then it's i'm not doing it but i've only watched two of boba fett uh i don't even know what it's on I'll go back and probably start over from episode one and redo it. It's on Disney. A few weeks. Disney? Okay, yeah. It's good, man. Are you a Star Wars guy? Yeah, of course. I love Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's awesome then. Yeah. Actually, uh, so uh, Scott came over the other day, and uh, he was helping me clean my barn out. And uh, you know, this is the barn where we lived at when I was a kid. And uh, he was uh, messing around in the dirt, and he found a Grand Moff Tarkin figurine from when I was a kid that I guess I lost out there. I'm like, surprised that old barn's still standing. It's still standing. Oh, uh, I didn't. I guess I didn't tell you. I'm gonna I'm gonna record this. So the inner part of the barn, I don't know if you remember, it was logs. It was an old log corn crib. And I had somebody come out. I'd had two people come out to like date it. They weren't, you know, they were just whatever, not scientists, I guess. One guy said 1870s. The other guy said like 1920s or 30s. And uh, I sent an email. So I looked up uh, uh, dendrochronologists. That's people that study uh, tree rings and date things by tree rings. Found out they had one in UofL. They have a dendrochronology lab up there. And uh, sent the lady an email. She's a professor up there. And, uh, yeah, she's going to apparently she's going to bring some students out here, and they're going to make like a project of it. Huh. Try to date this thing. We're gonna take sam, bring them out here, take samples of it, and then give me a date on it. But that's what she. I, I talked to her a little bit through email. That's what she specializes in. Because I, I was saying, I think most of the logs in there were oak, and she's like, "Yeah." She's like, "Actually, I'm trying to compile an index of oaks in this area." Uh, she'd done some other log cabins. It's just kind of like what she specialized in. She's like, "Yeah, that'd be really cool. I'd love to come out and sample it." So, I wonder how in the world they out. determine the age. I'm pretty curious now. What What do you mean? How, how just the mechanism of what? The, how would they determine the age of the, of the guys before or the dendrochronologist? The no, the dendrochronologist. Oh, what, well, what's their methodology? So, um, I'm curious. It, it basically has. So what they do is they create uh, indices of other tree rings. So this five year period, you know, in, in this area over a five. year the five-year period of 1971 to 1976, there'll be this specific pattern of oh, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that's tree a- rings. And, sure. and like, because they're all the same, you can incredibly accurately date trees all the way back. Okay, so this one ended in 1980, and it goes back, and it has this indices from the 30s. So now we have that, and we can, and you just, I mean, I don't know what it is. And it's obviously, it's all, like, uh, region-specific. Um, I know somewhere, I was, been reading up on this quite a bit like over in uh the middle east and stuff they have tree ring data going back you know five six thousand years like an unbroken line of tree ring data yeah from, sure. from one to the next to the next to the next no it's not one tree but... let's say that's how they can determine the like um like how much rain we got was based on the uh like thickness of yeah. the tree rings yeah th- so it's, it's like i mean there's all sorts of it's the rain it's the temperature it's uh uh like blights that happened um, during certain years, um, you know, fungal infections. It's all sorts of stuff. It's really neat how they do it and, and like, what all contributes to it. But. Uh, welcome back to the show, folks. It is Sunday, 
I'm a little hungover, so my brain is slow today. So this might be a laid back show. I'm not sure. I guess we'll find out. Um, well, Russia on the cusp of invading potentially Ukraine this uh, February 2022. Um, what have you been up to this week? Ah, uh, nothing much. Same old, same old. Uh, following the Russia thing, I've been watching Bosch's streams about uh, Russia Ukraine deal oh, it's been interesting everyone's secretly just hoping waiting for it to happen because otherwise it's a really boring stream it's just <laughs> him looking at you know it's just him looking at twitter and uh yeah so the whole time i'm like come on man let me just where's the opening salvo where's the where's the dead civilians let's get this party started so the entire anti-war left is secretly hoping for the missiles to start flying just for some entertainment value yeah is that what you're claiming <laughs> Uh, that's what I am. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for it. I think they are secretly too, just because we're so, uh, we're so programmed to, to not be able to pay attention to things unless there's something going on. You know? I think Putin is really hoping he doesn't have to invade. I mean, he's trying to get some concessions out of the U.S. and they're just not budging, man. Good. Seems inevitable. I don't see why we can't say, hey, at least concede to the, to the. To the disallowance to join NATO, I mean, at the very least, just to avoid war, if nothing else. Yeah, I don't know. It's, But then you disallow them joining NATO, and that just, uh, I think that just kind of permanently opens up, opens them up to, to being annexed, right? I mean, all that's all that does, right? I mean, maybe they could join NATO, and maybe there'd be some... Uh, uh, policy to where there can't be troops stationed there there can't be armaments stationed there something like that but it's i don't know it's, it seems like the only reason they wouldn't want them to join nato is because they have plans on annexing them right maybe either way they're getting annexed so what's the harm i mean if the alternative is annexation anyway just give them what they they're asking for it's not like we can continually appease them because they're already basically butting up to nato at that point poland is a member of nato yeah I don't yeah, know, I don't man. know. It's, this is like one of those weird... Uh... See, here's the problem. There's so many people in the United States, elite, you know, managerial, the State Department and all the think tanks who want war. All the Obviously, all the defense contractors want war. So you know that that point of view is well represented in the government. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's... Obviously, I, mean, I'm, I would be a terrible politician, but... It, it seems like it's at a certain point you have to take like a, a principled stand to stop these things in the future. You know, if if you make allowances and appease kind of continuously, then at, at at what point? Then you're just you're just perpetuating it further on down the line. Other whether it's Russia, whether it's other countries, because you're setting that precedent that. If you rattle your sabers loud enough, you're going to get something. It might not be all that you wanted, but you're going to get something. And, uh, but I mean, but on the other hand, like, what's the cost of going head to head with Russia? You know, and uh, is anybody willing to pay that cost for countries full of people that don't speak our language? Can't we just disarm by now? God, we were talking about nuclear disarmament 50 years ago. I mean, come on, guys. And this right here is why uh, more countries are not going to disarm. You know, Ukraine disarmed. Are they, they might, were they the last country to disarm? I think so. I don't know if they were the last country, but all the former Soviet bloc countries disarmed. Uh, their, their nukes, they gave the nukes to Russia as part of the... Uh, yeah, Ukraine, spe Ukraine specifically, I think, had like the all of or at least the vast majority of their, uh, the Soviet Union's nuclear armament, and they gave it all to Russia. Well, I think we talked about this, didn't we? Under yeah. the, uh, what was this, the, the Budapest Memorandum, where yeah. they were supposed to be protected. Either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good luck trying to get other people to disarm now. I don't know. I just really don't want to see a freaking war, man. Not this day and age. People don't need to die for state governments anymore. Come on. Come on. For yeah. freaking capitalist governments, give me a break bourgeois fucking liberal democracies. Ugh, worst. 
What is this clip you have me watching? Oh, just just <laughs> just watch it. This is my new favorite thing. Just watch this it. Is, we're we're just we're gonna do an Oprah segment. This is an actual song. This is real by Jordan Peterson. You get the point. This is it. Yeah, I hope I'm that. I'm hope I'm that creative when I get off benzos. You mean he wrote the song, or I guess he wrote and composed it. I don't. I literally just found this. I just I was listening to it and I was, I was cracking up because it, it's all like stuff he would say. You know, go home, get your get your stuff together, stop criticizing other people. You know, get your own clean your room, clean your room. Yeah, I don't know. Peterson, man, he has really gone off the deep end. I watch a couple of his interviews, his most recent interviews. He has gone off the deep end, man. He, I noticed. Uh, I love watching in the, it, too. In, in the Rogan interview, he was, like, really spastic. He's doing this the whole time, and I have to make this point. I don't know if it was a, you know, there were early reports when, it, when everything kind of broke about him that he would suffered some brain damage. Uh through the treatment in these Russian facilities. Um, them them Russians, do, man. There's no telling what they did to him over there. Yeah, <laughs> something having to do, because I mean, they put him in a, a medical, medically induced coma for however long, and, and that was the story that come out. So maybe, I don't know if it's that or if he's just he's putting on a new face or trying to reinvent himself or what, but he's he's gotten much more forceful in his delivery. It's a lot more theatric, too, so it makes me enjoy it. I'm, I'm, what was I'm a the, style over substance guy. You don't care what he says. You just care what. How well do you say it? How per, how performative he is when he delivers it. I'm an American. The tirade he went on about how the the Bible is the first book and no book came before it. <laughs> you remember that? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what that meant <laughs> per se, but he... He said it forcefully. He 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 was very confident when he was saying that. Um, yeah, I don't know. But we, I could get into that because I, it's. He, uh, I guess he was saying like it's, it's kind of the foundational text of Western, Western thought and, and Western culture, and it's just like, kind of it is. I mean, the King James version, at least, like that's where a lot of our language and uh, language in particular, the, the way we speak comes from but that was not foundational like that was a product of king james the seventh and second of scotland who was just like a dude that was kind of a polymath of his time and i think we're way more based on uh classical like hellenistic books easily than a, than the bible in particular i mean the bible itself is is certainly the new testament kind of has uh roots in hellenistic text itself too so it's the type of thing that people who aren't super well educated would maybe believe if they're like. They love it. It reminds me of when Rogan was uh, saying that um, the United States was the first democracy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, like, once again. The United again, States, we invented democracy. Yeah, once again, the Nobody. Greeks got there first. Greeks were there first. So this is an article from. Uh, WLKY. This is a Louisville-based uh, story here. Quintez Brown Jr. Uh, goes into a Democratic candidate's offices who's running for um, the Louisville article. mayor. Louisville mayor. Running for mayor, a uh, uh, mayoral candidate, yeah. Craig Greensburg's office. I guess let me play the clip here. These guys are so gross to me, dude. Local activists accused of trying to kill the Democratic mayoral candidate appeared in court this morning. 
And Quintez Brown is charged with attempted murder and four counts of wanton endangerment. Police say Brown went to Craig Greenberg's campaign headquarters in the Butchertown market Monday morning and shot several times at Greenberg and his staff members. The judge raised Brown's bond from $75,000 to $100,000. His attorney says Brown will undergo a mental evaluation. That's most of it. He didn't really kill anybody. Um, he was not He was like a BLM activist. He was an activist. He did write. Yeah. He wrote for the, like. He just wrote some articles and stuff. Yeah, there's really yeah, no and, motive here whatsoever. Uh, well, there's no there's no release motive. Like obviously he had a reason for going in and doing it. So, uh, some political reason I would assume. It probably a harebrained crackpot theory. I don't but, think uh, so, man. It doesn't seem like it. Seems you don't like think he's, so. No, he's. 21 years old, that's the age at which schizophrenia, like, kicks in. There was this other there was this other time where he disappeared and, like, wound up in New York, and nobody knew yeah. where the heck he was. His family didn't know where he was. He also, well, he was also a mayoral candidate. Uh, Wait, Quintez some... Brown Jr. was? Yes. He, wow, that's young to be running for uh, mayor. Yeah, I think it was just, like, some independent, you know, it was not, uh, I guess, a serious run. And then he disappeared. And I think that's when he kind of decided to step out of the spotlight. And his his family released it, whatever. But uh, yeah. So, a anyways, it, it's just going to kind of lead in. Um, the, I guess the many facets of, of what I was wanting to talk about. But if you just want to go ahead, and just play the next uh, clip. Uh, yeah, sure. He's palpitating. At this point, we're living <laughs> under a corporate and medical fascism. Good. This is tyranny. Good. When do we get this. to use the guns? <laughs> no, and I'm, and, I, and I'm not, that's not a joke. I'm not saying it like that. I mean, literally, where's the line? How many elections are they going to steal before we kill these people? So, well, no. I, 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 no, no <laughs> Good I, question. No, stop. You Look, believe that they're stealing no, it. I'm going to denounce that yeah. and tell you why. Because you're playing into all their plans. All right. And they're all trying right. to make you do this. That's, that's good. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I never thought I'd say it. Um, I'm going to agree with the moron from the Charlie Kirk event. Uh, right. Incidentally, could you imagine being such a dullard that you get online, you buy tickets, make plans with your wife, get dressed up, and go out to a Charlie Kirk committing hate, just to, just to listen to Charlie Kirk commit hate crimes against reason. Uh, yeah, I, I'd probably want to get violent to it at that point. But honestly, his logic is sound. Um, sure. His premises, I don't think, are... are uh, substantiated, but yeah, I mean, the logic is sound. If someone is doing what Charlie Kirk says that the the left in America is doing, we're trying to just fundamentally destroy democracy, the the uh, the, ba the family unit, um, impoverish working class people. Um, there is a point, wherever that point is, where uh, any individual will be justified in, in uh, taking up arms and, and resorting to political violence. It kind of become a, a, a cause celeb over the past few years. You know, there's just constant uh, constant headlines being made against about one group or another uh, basically engaging in political violence, and then we're all kind of having the, uh, uh, the talk well, it's 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 basically it's part of the national discourse to analyze these different groups and their justifications for the use of political violence, and you know, it kind of breaks down into a, a a big fight. And I think most people would say that it's it's never justified. And well, the, the, we'll play. So there's a clip up here of Chomsky, and he he's talking about it. We'll just go ahead okay. And play it. Resistance. We're faced with this destructive juggernaut. And we, there's a growing sense that time is running short with global warming, uh, corporate uh, control of, of our government and other governments. And I wonder if you believe that nonviolence is capable, a nonviolent approach is capable of saving the day, or do we need to expand our uh, strategies to encompass uh, other tactics? Well, that's, now we're back to uh, Confucius. Uh, if a, if a nonviolent approach is not capable of doing it, we might as well kiss each other goodbye because there's no question that a violent approach won't work. In fact, a violent approach is a, 
uh, violence is exactly what systems of power want. You're moving to the arena where they, where they dominate. I mean, I remember debating this with kids in the 60s who uh, wanted, you were going out to demonstrations and you know, wanted to wear uh, the helmets because the police are going to attack. And what I argued, and I think is correct, is that you shouldn't. I mean, if you wear a helmet, they're going to come back with uh, assault rifles. And if you have an assault rifle, they're going to come back with tanks. And if you have tanks, they'll come back with nuclear weapons. I mean, force is their strength. The only strength we have is nonviolence. And it works. In fact, if you take uh, a look at Iraq, good. it's quite a striking. Yeah, so I guess Chomsky's position here is uh, that, and it's, he's specifically talking about violence against the state as opposed to violence against in other individuals or other groups in the society that you live in. But uh, I guess his contention is that it's, it never works or it's, it's certainly not the best choice um, because the, the state has a monopoly on violence and their uh, uh, predilection towards violence and, and capabilities for violence uh, greatly succeeds any individual or, or non-state groups. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can completely disagree with that. I don't, I don't even know how you could say that on us. I mean, there, there's so many instances of violence, political violence being used where it has been effective. And I think even in the instances where it doesn't seem to be effective, where it seems to be the nonviolent solution that uh, succeeds, I, I would argue that it is because of the, the threat of violence or the, uh, the, the kind of Violent movements that go hand in hand with these nonviolent movements that that the nonviolent movements become the the viable options. Um, number one, like let's say the uh, uh, French Revolution, for example. It was you have an absolute monarchy. This person is is completely in control of the state. Um, in a situation like that, I mean, there's just absolutely nothing you can do. You can't write a letter. You can't peacefully protest. They have the absolute monopoly. On, well, they don't have the. They seem to have the absolute monopoly on violence. Chomsky would argue that they do have the absolute monopoly on violence, and uh, you know, then they got drug out into the streets and uh, dragged to the guillotine, and 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 it changed it. You know, for better or worse, it did change it. Um, I think the the parties that that take control after the violence has been done is kind of the the. What leads the uh, kind of after effects to be acceptable or not? But that's that's kind of a separate point. Um, the civil rights movement in the fifties and sixties. Um, you know, we all think about MLK and his nonviolent approach. But would anybody have really paid attention to MLK if it wasn't for Black Panthers? You know, when you have the Black Panthers out there being aggressive and being you know threatening. That the the, you, the the movement has momentum from both sides, but it is the aversion that people I would say it's the aversion that people have towards the violence and the fear that the violent part of the movement produces in people that makes the nonviolent part of the movement MLK seem like the 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 reasonable uh, I guess route to take for for most people. You know, this is the same thing with. Uh, Gandhi, you know, Gandhi is kind of renowned for being this completely peaceful, passive uh, guy that, that defeated the British Empire in India. Um, there was a violent counterpart to Gandhi. This is the Indian mutiny. You know, there was incredible violence being done by the, by the Indian people, I guess, in retaliation against the violence being done to them by the British Empire. But it was, it was the violent part of the movement. That, that gave credence and, and I think put the uh, fear into the people that they were they were perpetrating the violence against to, to make them choose. Okay, well, let's just go with the nonviolent route. Let's let's deal with these deal with these people so we don't have to deal with these people. Yeah, Chomsky's had a more nuanced take on this. He's talking specifically about now and this country and mm -hmm. um, 
potential socialist revolution in this country. And obviously, you know, the French Revolution, they didn't have all the weaponry. There was just a bunch of people and a lot more peasants than there were uh, royalty. Um, I think the level of indoctrination is so much higher now. Like, you know, what are, what is the left? Like 2 3% of the population? Um, you know, the non-liberal left, the non-capitalist left, basically. Um, yeah. So there's there's really no potential for violent success. Um, I think that's his point here. Obviously, um, there's always the debate about Antifa, for example, during the BLM, right? They were doing property destruction. Um, and a lot of people have arguments against it. You know, they don't think it's right. But at the end of the day, riots work. That's a lot, a large part of the civil rights movement was riots, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that, yeah, that BLM is a perfect example. I mean, of course, the violence of BLM, to the extent that it was violent, I mean, it was really just a response to state violence. You know, this was, a, yeah, I mean, they were responding to police violence, essentially, and they committed violence in their, uh, in their own, and, and it created change. I mean, this is a, it's kind of a national discussion now. There's police precincts across the country that are that are changing their policies and yeah the whole idea behind anarchism is you get rid of the state and you get rid of the police because those are the institutions that defend the system the status quo right um you're not going to prevent redistributing jeff bezos's wealth without the fucking police that's their whole role in society sure yeah uh, certainly for something like that but i i mean i'm, I'm speaking even in i guess a, a much more general sense uh for any movement you know the uh the Stonewall riots, for example, and that was kind of the catalyst that set off the uh, gay and trans rights movement. You know, it took that violent act to give credence to the nonviolent people that 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 kind of uh, uh, guided the movement along after they started it off. The Haitian Revolution, man. I mean, I mean, Haitian Revolution. Yeah, it takes violence to enforce a system. It, it takes violence, you know. It's not. It's not fair to say it's unjustified to resist your oppression. It's just not fair to say, and, and I don't think that's what Chomsky's saying here. Again, like I said, I think this is him specifically talking about uh, potential social change in countries like the United States. You know, we're not going to do much against the military, right, or in the police. They're pretty indoctrinated, man. It would take a lot. The whole idea yeah. behind non-viral I, resistance is you non-violently resist, and the police refuse to kill you. They have mm -hmm. to refuse to kill you because they associate themselves with you. You're part of the working class. They're part of the working class. But these guys, yeah. they're, they've been othering people their whole lot. That's, you know, that's their role. Okay, yeah. So, uh, actually, I, I, let me indulge for a little bit. You know, I, I, I do love some philosophy. Uh, so, Immanuel Kant wrote about this. And he lived, actually, during the time of the French Revolution. And he was a, uh, he was a, a deeply sympathetic to the, the, Republicanism and the cause of the French Revolution, or just to the French Revolution in general. Um, but he strictly disavowed violence. He, let's see. Yeah, so he actually had a quote. All resistance against the supreme legislative power, all incitement of the subjects to violent expressions of discontent, all defiance which breaks out into rebellion is the greatest and most punishable crime in a commonwealth, for it destroys its very foundation. So... Good. <laughs> destroy the commonwealth yeah. i'm good yeah yeah so uh, but and kind of kant had this contradiction where he supported the revolution but he disavowed the actions that were required and were carried out in order to make the revolution possible um yeah you know political violence would be anti and i think uh, this a lot of with kant it comes down to the idea of like the social contract we have a social contract now. Initially, we were we were born in like a state of nature where there was no government, there was nothing. We each had our own individual uh, ambitions and and things that we were trying to achieve. And the only way that we could deal with other people was through violence. And then we create governments. We have a social contract, and with that social contract, we give up our rights, our individual rights uh, to violence, and and delegate that authority solely to the government um, and that's what he had the problem with was the violation i guess he, he would have put it as the violation of that social contract you can't just take it upon yourself it's an immoral it's a violation to take it upon yourself to commit violence um, either against the government or against another group or person uh, 
without the yeah without the government allowing it. Um, well, I think that's correct so, in in terms of like an individual. Um, well, even with the group, uh, what what I'm trying to say is Kant was a pussy. Uh, Kant felt that him and others uh, like him. This, <laughs> yeah. Well, he he had an interesting way of looking at it, though. He felt that he and others like him that supported the violence but didn't participate, and this is his word, uh, that didn't participate were a community of onlookers. Um, those that committed the violence either against the state or in opposition to the state uh, were committing immoral acts. But those immoral acts could be useful and even necessary for the community to better conditions for all. This, I feel like that's kind of the argument that I was making in that, you know, in the civil rights, the uh, Black Panthers were the, the revolutionaries. They were acting in opposition to the social contract. They were acting immorally because it wasn't their right to use violence. And the community of onlookers would be the, you know, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King that were able to step in and, and take up the, the void left by the violent acts to create the better society. And I think it's, you can generally judge how well a violent revolution is going to work or a violent action in, in whatever service of whatever, uh, means you want by, I guess, who ends up being the one to, to kind of settle the affairs and to, to make sure everything goes well. You know, if it's, it's, if it's violent people, um, like in the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, uh, things generally don't go that well. But if they just kind of make the mess or, or break the system and let the other people, the, the community of onlookers that have not committed the immoral acts to come in and, and set things back up again after, after the old system's been broken down, then things tend to go a little bit better. So it's not okay to commit violence, but it's okay to take advantage of others who commit the violence. Yes, that that's Kant's view. <laughs> I, I I wouldn't put it like that. That's how Kant put it. Uh, I yeah, I I would just say that yeah, it's the uh, that the the nonviolent protest and the nonviolence is is just made possible by the violence. You have to have the threat of violence for the nonviolent. You know, if if people don't care about the uh, whatever change you're trying to affect, um, it is the threat of violence that that makes them start listening to the people using the nonviolent means of social change. Uh, there's a there's a pretty popular sort of viewpoint on the left out there that says that um, a violent violent revolution can't happen in the United States, really, because people are so freaking pacified, you know, that the, fir- the whole thing about the Russian Revolution was liberty and bread. Um, if people have enough to eat, they're not going to take up arms. They're not going to put their life on the line. And in my opinion, the people who are willing to stand up and put their life on the line for what they believe in, they should be honored and uh, revered, not, you know, not chastised. That's my opinion. Uh, people who oh, have stand up to the oppression, you know. Absolutely. And, and you know, you're speaking more of, I guess, systemic like complete change and i'm i'm talking about that and certainly that would be harder and that would be a lot more difficult to affect change like that with violence but you know even on the small gay rights for like i brought up you know these are these are smaller things that uh the violence can kind of galvanize society and it can even go the opposite way so there was a uh barry winchell uh was the young man that was in the, the army and was killed because he was gay. You know, that was an pol- act of political violence that, was it necessary? I mean, a lot of change, a lot of very good change come about as a result of that killing, but it, it kind of went in the opposite way. Sure. I Can guess. You imagine? The, I, could, you know, and there's, there's a lot of instances like that, and it's. Could you imagine if Antifa stormed the Capitol building, how many laws would be enacted to, uh prevent future occurrences of that sort of thing. Oh, like, sure. A small violent act could have an overreaction that would really hurt the cause. That's sort of one of the arguments against violent action. Um, 
you know, property destruction, that's one thing um, that's sort of similar to what, like, the um, the, the water rights, uh, the, uh, the indigenous activists are doing with the pipelines, destroying the tractors yeah. and shit. I'm sure you saw the photographs. Oh, yeah. It's property destruction. It works. This is capitalism, man. This is why general strikes are the most powerful tool we have. I mean, they need the shit produced uh, to make their money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's my take, at least. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. It's 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 something. It's just it's really prevalent. It comes up a lot. Um, it's interesting to talk about. And I think uh, too many people. I feel like people don't really think about this enough, and they just kind of go to the, you know, violence is never justified. Um, I wouldn't say I, it's I, never justified, but I don't think it's it's not uh, the it's not the preferred strategy. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's happen. it's just an an idiom that people fall back on when they haven't put much thought into it. Um, I, I'd also I'd done some reading about a uh, climate activist, and uh, I think yeah. So uh, there's there's a bunch of climate activist groups that um, it's, part of their founding doctrine is that we will not in any sense commit any form of violence, whether economic or physical violence, and. Uh, I just, I, it seemed kind of anti, there is violence being inflicted on us right now in having our environment destroyed. This is going to have serious, actual economic and physical repercussions on everyone around the world. Um, and if something like that is going to happen, it, something, that's what we are facing. And your organization is not even, uh, is completely opposed to going and, and destroying some coal coal mining equipment. Or, you know, uh, well, that, there's a there was there was one fellow in particular, uh, Andrew Ma, Andreas Mom. Um, he was speaking. He actually wrote this article about uh, SUVs in London. He's like, look, if you had 50 people go around and fuck up four SUVs a night for one month. He's like, there would there'd be no more SUVs. Like, people would just stop bringing them in there. You know, this is, do like $1,000 worth of damage. <laughs> yeah, you do $1,000 worth of damage to each one. Just walk around. No one would ever see you. Take 50 people over a month, just a few a night. He's like, but but nobody does that. And it would cause, it, that would bring about a lot of good, you know, relieve congestion and, uh, and smog in a busy city like London. But, yeah, so he was saying that these, uh, once again, all these people like Immanuel Kant, they're a bunch of pussies. Just stop being pussies. Well, there's a the 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 the, um, the climate situation is maybe hard to grasp, but a a, a more clear cut example of that situation would be like, for example, if I get my way, we pass a hundred percent tax rate over four hundred k, a hundred percent capital gains tax. Take all the shares, take them all, Tony, and redistribute the oh. wealth. There would be there would be political violence. I promise you, it'd be from Peter people like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk. They would be committing the they would be committing the violence at that point, and it would be our duty to resist that violence as a state, um, as the people. Yeah, well, there's more of us than there are Peter Thiel. So, bring it on, ladies and gentlemen. If you are interested in new tropics, check out my website, metamaxperformance.com. We have ten percent off or winter sale still going on, so check it out. Get your new tropics while you can at maxperformance.com. Gentle listeners, Shire Hemp Farms is your number one source for CBD and Delta 8 products. Check us out now for wholesale pricing on Delta 8 carts. We have some new Delta 8 in with new American-made carts. Always the lowest price. Check us out. Support local Kentucky farms, local Kentucky businesses, ShireHempFarms.com. So that's so I remember him as when I was a child. I remember seeing him on TV some, and he has um, been making the rounds again after his da- big downfall. I thought I would introduce you to this gentleman. I'm not sure if you know who this is. Mark Driscoll. He was originally considered sort of a lefty guy, but after his fall, he kind of went hard right here. Hmm. This is uh, Mark Driscoll um, on critical race theory from late last year. Warmed. 
And uh, if you're one of those guys watching and you've spent more money on your, uh, if you spent more money on your wardrobe than your library, uh, you probably should uh, sell some of your Jordans and go buy some Talking commentaries people, right? and beef yourself up because it's Jordans. more time for the gospel. Okay. He's wearing like a $500 leather jacket, by the way. I, that's what I was getting right <laughs> I was. It was just too easy to point that out. I know. Traditional theory is basically how we build things. Um, and so Christianity would fit in the concept of traditional theory. How do you build uh, law and order? Our God is a God of law. His, his word is filled with laws. How do, you, um, how do you architect a family? It talks about husbands and wives, and it has specific things to say to both. Uh, what's the best environment for a child? Well, it tells us that God made marriage, and he made us male and female, and he made us to increase in number, to fill the earth, subdue it, to parent, to raise our children in the admonition and instruction of the Lord. The Bible tells us the basic principles for um, economics, private property theory. Not everything should belong to the government. You're not allowed to steal some of those issues. And so the Bible is traditional uh, theory. It is about how to build things, how to build society, how to build economy, how to build family, how to build gender, how to build sexuality, identity, and marriage. Critical theory comes along, and I won't get into all the history of it, uh, but critical theory is just that. It is an overarching ideology, it's a disposition, it's a worldview, and it literally critiques everything that was built. If you think of traditional theory, it's like a construction crew. Critical theory is like a demolition crew. My dad was a union drywaller, and he would build things. Um, other guys would get paid to come in and demo and tear things down. Traditional theory is about construction. Uh, critical theory is about deconstruction. And the point is, it's much easier to be uh, one who is critical of those who are building than it is to actually build something. It's very easy, for example, to criticize a leader rather than to actually lead people. It's very easy to criticize parents than it is to raise your own kids. It's very easy to criticize uh, an economy than it is to find a way to generate revenue that cares for constituency. It's very hard to do something. It's very easy to criticize those who are doing something. And I believe that God largely works through traditional theory, and I believe that Satan works through critical theory. Uh, the criticism started in heaven where Satan and demons, Revelation 12, 7 through 9, they criticized God. They, they had criticism of his leadership, his decision-making, his org chart, his structure. They didn't like his kingdom. They felt that it was unjust. So let me say this. The first rebellion and overthrowing in the name of social justice happened in the unseen realm, which means that the spirit of the accuser is now at work in the world, and he's largely at work through critical theory. Okay, so that is Mr. Um, Mark Driscoll. And his um, explaining how critical theory is just really Satan, basically. Mm -hmm. um, this is the propaganda that every powerful person ever wishes they had on their side here, apparently. This is basically Jordan Peterson, right? I mean, levels of, you know, don't question authority. This is the opposite yeah. of, this is the opposite of Noam Chomsky here. This is like the anti John. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, from a from a biblical perspective, I mean, he's he's one hundred percent right. Um, I don't know, the man. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> the, the essence of Christianity is faith. He said it, God it, has an org chart that Satan <laughs> objected to. <laughs> well, he's taking poetic license, <laughs> right? His language I'll give him that. Question. <laughs> it's, it's definitely yeah, taking some liberties with it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, in, in a purely theological sense, I, he's 100% right in his interpretation of uh, biblical precedents. I mean, yeah, you're, you're not supposed to. The, the whole point of, of divine command is that you just you don't question it, you know, and, and if you do question it, it kind of. Uh, I mean, you're, you're questioning God at that at that sense. So he's saying don't question, question anything. Plan. He's, he's saying, "Don't question your, don't question anything." Yeah, I mean, it's, calling it's out just all a, critics. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's the logical conclusion. If if you accept these the premises that that God has organized these different social structures and economic structures, family structures, um, yeah, I mean, it, it it just logically follows that uh, questioning them or critiquing them in any way is kind of an affront to God, and that you are no longer a, a real Christian. So. 
I don't know. Man. <laughs> I mean, this really once again, like, he, he's he's like the Charlie Kirk guy. His logic is sound. It's just his premises are a little off. You know, in this case, uh, there's just no evidence that God ever said any of that stuff. Here's another clip to introduce him a little bit here. This is his opinion on Black Lives Matter. Uh-oh. Hang on, God just, just real quick. Does he accurately represent what Black Lives Matter is, or does he make up something that he says is Black Lives Matter? No, he reads it off the blacklivesmatter.com website. Oh, okay. And that, that is representative of the entire movement, apparently, even though it's been literally taken over by the DNC. Black trans women. We build a space that's an institution that is free from sexism, misogyny, and environments in which men are centered. Men loving, leading, like Christ, their families. We dismantle. I told you that cultural Marxism was about what? Dismantling uh, institutions. Cultural, cultural Marxism. We dismantle yeah. the patriarchal practice. That means men leading their families. That requires mothers to work double shifts so they can mother in private, even as they participate in public justice work. What it's saying is there's a lot of kids that don't have a dad. Therefore, the government needs to be the dad and provide more for mom so she has time for social justice work. My answer would be, how about we fix the dads? How about we fix the dads? I'm just going to pause here for a second because I need to respond to this. This is, he starts off this point by saying there's a lot of kids without dads. And at the end, he says, fix the dads. Like, if the dads aren't there, how the fuck are you going to fix them, dude? Jesus going to bring him back from the dead or, like, let him out of prison? I mean, what's his – this bothers me so much. I'm a, I'm a huge and, advocate of paid motherhood, and this really irks me, dude. Yeah, and this is also uh, – it, it's – it is a Christian. It is a Christian theology that's it's really clearly derivative of American revivalism, where they assume that biblical times was like the 1950s, or, or like their idealized version of the 1950s, where everybody has a mom and a dad. I don't know. It's just it's it's a it's a I guess a minor point, but it's completely ahistorical that there were like these uh these perfect family units in Iron Age Judea at the time. Everybody had a mom and a dad, and they all follow this this kind of much much later christian ideal of the family unit he acts like marriage is like once you get married that's it like there's no divorce there's no death there's no prison it's just you know he wants you to get married then have kids in that order yeah. and don't die try not to die because the government should have should have no role in uh, helping raise kids apparently yeah no i mean it's 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 the idea is obviously silly, and and his justifications for the idea are silly. Like, I mean, it's it's completely ahistorical. And what did the apostles do? They left their families to go hang out with Jesus on a boat. Is that true? They, yeah, Jesus told them, I, "I'll set uh, a father against son, mother against daughter, man against wife. You must come forsake all others to come and follow me. Forsake all others. Get rid of your family. I'm the only thing that's important." He, Jesus was the was the Iron Age diva. I mean, that's he's he's the Mariah Carey love, of their day. I love the idea that like men should be like the head of the household and give all the orders and you know have their wives waiting hand and foot on them because Jesus was a man, like and God is a man. I love that whole the whole philosophy of that is just seems very <laughs> seems very um, um, convenient for the men who wrote this. What well, it is. The, Whenever they wrote. It is. If we could, if I could find a chick that believed it too, it'd be very convenient. <laughs> you got to get you a Christian woman, Tony. I, I do. I do. <laughs> Bradford Wilcox, the leading sociologist on marriage and family in America, he's at the University of Virginia. He has proven, with the largest data analysis and survey in the history of our country, that the best environment is the one that God created: a man. And a woman, get married, have a baby, worship God, and raise the baby. It's not perfect. I don't think the worship God part not, was part not of perfect. the study. I'm not a perfect parent. Probably not. But it's the best. It's the best. And what happens is God gives certain responsibilities to men. And if we transfer those to government, we hurt women and children. 
Furthermore, we go bankrupt because if you keep enlarging the government to replace the man and the man is disincentivized to work to meet the needs of his family because he's not responsible for his family, eventually you run out of people to tax. Okay. So that's Mark Driscoll, his hot takes on basically just grifting off of the right wing Jordan Peterson crowd. Um, I'm probably grifting off some right wing think tank money too. I don't know. This guy used to be huge though, and he has fallen quite a bit, man. Thir th almost 30,000 views on this video, but this is unusual for his channel. Black Lives Matter? Question mark? <laughs> Question mark? He just had a stream today. You missed it. Oh, man. It's over now. Does God punish people for their sin? And he can be quite entertaining. He did, he's, didn't always used to be just like a normal old, like, God-grift right-winger. He was a founding member of Mars Hill Church in Seattle. The church was enormous, incorporated into parts of Acts 29, this big conglomerate of 422 churches around the world. Um, this was founded in 98. And he became very famous because he was known as the cussing preacher. He was sort of considered socially liberal, for I guess for an evangelist or whatever. Um, he was on TV shows and shit. He had this book, um, Real Marriage, which I think was his first book. But he has a bunch of other books. Um, and when I, I remember seeing him when I was a child on um, one of these, uh, maybe it was Oprah. But here he is on, is this The View? Was The View around back then? I guess it was. You have to forgive, like, the audio. This is recorded off of, like, the TV. Did you agree about sex? Yeah, we did when we got married. And I think we started as close friends. And then as the work and the duties of life come in, the friendship started to wane. And I think that affects all levels of intimacy. But I, I read the book, and one of the things you say is that you thought of sex as God. And Grace, you thought of sex as gross. Yeah, we talk in the book that some people see sex as God. It's way too important to them, almost obsessive. For those that are overly religious or perhaps come from an abusive background, they... His wife's you know, pretty hot. You know, before the show, he was like, now hold my hand the entire time. I'm going to beat the shit I, out of you when we get home. <laughs> yeah, she, it's, it's not even like a comfortable, natural, relaxed hand holding. Like, she's reaching, but yeah. I don't know. She is hot, though. Yeah. She's, I mean... I'd fuck when I think about When I think about having sex with Mark Driscoll, I think it's gross, too. I don't blame her. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he, he's probably making bank. That was his first book. Oh, back then he was, dude. Um, here's another book of his, Porn Again Christian, a frank discussion on pornography and masturbation. So you can see how this guy became very popular, yeah. talking about sex openly as a, as a pastor. Um, here's a nice quote from the book. The purpose of pornography is clearly lust, and lust for anyone but your wife is condemned by God as a grievous evil repeatedly throughout both the Old and New Testament. The act of lusting after the unclothed body of a woman is not a sin. If she is your bride, then you are simply making the song of songs sing again to God's glory and your joy. If she is not your bride, then you are simply sinning. So, I thought you just weren't supposed to covet your neighbor's wife, but I mean, what if it's like a cartoon? Like, there's cartoon porn. Is that a sin? Um... Well, so Old Testament is uh, like taking actions. That's that's what you're talking about. Also, that's from the, uh, the Ten Commandments, coveting your wife. That's all I um, know about the Bible. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus takes it a step further, and he says, "Any man who has lusted after his uh, lusted after another woman in his mind is guilty of what's the what's the sin? I'm completely blanking on it. Adultery. So." Oh. Even the, thinking uh, about it? And even hang on. Uh let me pull it up. <laughs> so I go to Google and I accidentally hit P and my porn hub come up. So just odd that that was open a private tab, dude. Yeah, I know it. Um Jesus Adultery Woman. Okay, yeah, this is uh this is Matthew five, twenty seven and twenty eight. So you have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. So he's referencing the Old Testament there. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Um, yeah, once again, he's, he's biblically sound. Especially, I mean, with, with Jesus' teaching. So um, I'm... Jesus, every, everybody's what, going to hell. Everybody. Yeah, well, that's 
this is why Hitchens was so upset. You know, this is why he called uh, he called Jesus a uh, celestial North Korea or heaven a celestial North Korea. You can be convicted of thought crimes. <laughs> thought crimes. You know, yeah, it's, exactly. It's, 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 it's you, right. you don't even have to like Old Testament was stuff you did. You you had to sure. do it. Uh, Jesus, you know, gentle Jesus, speak and mild. He upgraded it. Uh, he goes. There's some other crap that Jesus said too. That's it's along those same veins, but. Um, yeah, yeah, he's 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 right, biblically. Hitting the shit on the nose, but yeah, uh, certainly. I mean, when I watch porn, I I look at those women quite lustfully in my heart. So I guess I'm a, I'm pretty adulterous, I assume. I don't know though. Has he ever get? I just wonder has Mark Driscoll ever gotten really high, where he's been up for like a day or two, and then you we'll start watching it. porn? Okay. <laughs> What are you going to do at that point? In 2007, Driscoll ended the term limits on executive leadership of the church and consolidated power. He began making decisions without elder council approval, which basically dissolved the elders council. Um, there were two dissenting elders uh, who didn't approve of his like consolidation, and he fired those two. Um, so he pulled a Stalin. The purge. The other elders didn't take kindly. Um, it took a long time, but eventually there were protests against the firings and his uh, craziness. Um, here is Triscoll in 2010, just so I can give you a timeline here. I want to. I want you to really know this guy and understand him. This is Mark Triscoll on yoga. Um, how about we do another one, guys? Should Christians stay away from yoga because of its demonic roots? Totally. Yoga is demonic. Now, is stretching and exercise demonic? No. Okay, so if you're lazy, you should still stretch and exercise. <laughs> but here's yoga. Yoga is Hinduism. That there's a spark of divinity within you. It's so he goes on to explain how Hinduism is demonic, basically. Um, okay. Here's some... I, I found some evidence that uh, that um, yoga is demonic. I mean, if you ever watch this shit, it's pretty. You know what this reminds me of? I'm What's that? Have you, have you seen the Suspiria remake? The what is it? Suspiria, the movie. They like remade it um, <clears throat> a few years ago. No. Oh, you got to check it out, man. I won't spoil it. You have to check it out. It's a weird movie. Oh, yeah. Uh. I don't know if we should. I posted a uh, another link for a yoga thing up the top. Yeah, maybe let's just watch this and see if this is demonic. Do you remember her? I was no. Do you remember her? Um, I, she's sideways. No, I can't see her. This is. I dated her in two thousand eight. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. She used to live right down the road here. She lives in Bali now. She's a yoga instructor in Bali. Huh. Why? Yeah, yeah. Whatever. More power to her. Yeah. Oh, we were just talking about yoga, and I was I was thinking about committing sin in my heart about that chick I used to date. Yeah. Fifteen years ago. I mean, anyway, this is thirty I mean, minutes long. Is she just roll, ball rolling her glutes for thirty minutes? Oh, there's a shot over. Yeah. What? There she is. Oh, yeah, she's pretty. Oh, yeah, she's great. I don't know Canadian, how much. Canadian, actually. She's, she's from Canada. She moved down ah, here, okay. and then she moved to she moved back to Canada. That's why we broke up, and then she moved to Bali. I'm not sure what the uh, instructional value is of watching somebody roll a ball on their freaking glutes. <laughs> I don't either, but. <laughs> Got a lot of views, man, 40,000 views. Oh, did it really? Uh, ha half of those are it. me. 
probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Anyways, Jenna, sorry about that. I'm just joking, honey. Good seeing you. I'm glad you're doing well. It was in 2014. This all came to a head, basically. Um, there were articles written in Salon and New York Times about these demonstrations because there was demonstrations in front of his church uh, due to the firings and whatnot. He eventually resigned. Amid an investigation by church elders, they found bullying and patterns of persistent sinful behavior. He has been accused of misogyny. When speaking of a scandal involving another preacher who was caught cheating on his uh, wife, <laughs> he said that although it may not be the wife's fault for not making herself sexually available, she may not be helping her husband stay on track. So she, you know, does a soft condemnation of the wife. Although it may not be the wife's fault for not making herself sexually available, in quotes, she may not be helping her husband stay on track. She made herself sexually available, but not sexually available enough, probably. That's why. Even though the, the, the preacher was cheating with a man. So it didn't really apply. I don't know why he said that. Here is a hilarious clip of Driscoll from a few years prior to the scandal. There we go. You're not a man. You're a boy. Some of you guys. It's just. I got blows so up. I love this. Frustrating. Some of you guys have been coming here for years. You still got your hands all over your girlfriend. Some of you guys have been coming here for years. Still not praying with your wife. Some of you guys have been coming here for years. You're still single and having sex. Some of you guys will even, even, even as I'm preaching the sermon, some of you will be sitting next to your girlfriend or your fiance or your wife. Some of you guys have already given her that look. Don't cry. Don't let them know they're talking about me. Just hold it together. You've already intimidated her right ear. Always telling women not to cry. Some of you guys have already whispered in her ear. I don't want to hear it. We're not talking about this in the car on the way home. Some of you have already whispered in her ear. I'm sorry, I'll do better. Trust me. Let's just move on real quickly. How dare you? Who in the hell do you think you are? Channeling Alex Jones. Abusing a woman. <laughs> neglecting a woman. Being a coward. A fool. I love the hair. Being like your father, Adam. Who do you think you are? <laughs> you are not me. God. You are just a man. You're not an impressive man. You're not a respectful Dude, that's man. Alex Jones. I don't know why he'd be accused of being a bully. I mean, geez. Seems like a nice enough guy to me. I don't know. That's him going after men who, it's unclear. It's really unclear who he's going after here. That, that argue with their wives. Maybe their wives should chill the F out, quit crying all the time, and uh, quit complaining that I spend all my money on magic cards. Well, it seems like he's going after women for, or going after men for abusing their wives, but, like, he kind of changes the position on the women thing later in his life, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as you do, there was a, like, there was a rant leaked from 2000 uh, during these four, 20, 2014 protests. Uh, somebody leaked this uh, um, during this scandal. Driscoll had made anonymous posts on a message board, a religious message board. I guess that's a thing. Um, under the pseudonym William Wallace. <laughs> and there's a, That's me. There's a Vox article written about this. I'm going to quote from the Vox article. At one point in 2000, Driscoll posted messages anonymously on an online church message board under the pseudonym William Wallace. As Wallace, Driscoll's main battle cry seemed to be that Christian men were becoming a, quote, pussified nation, by which he meant that they'd become sensitive and emasculated. Since Christianity, he said, was building a new nation, Driscoll invented new words for them to use. Here are a few of them. A male lesbian is any man that thinks and acts like a woman because he thinks that makes him a better man. 
male lesbian. So if you're a man and you act like a woman because it thinks you think it makes you a better man, then you're a male lesbian. Yeah, I agree with that. 100%. I don't know what it means to act like a woman. That seems really sexist to me. I'm not sure what he's implying there. Is he talking about how long ago? How, do you know when that quote was from? 2000. This is all from the message board from 2000. Metrosexuals. Remember them? That's who he's probably talking about. <laughs> In which case, I completely agree. Yeah, you're wearing you're wearing skinny jeans before they were nails. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Get get the hell out of here. Come on. Put some jinkos on, man. Go being a male lesbian. The jinkos. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was 2000. Okay, so yes. In 2000, that would have been acceptable. I've seen hey. some Jinkos in the wild again the other day, by the way. Blew my mind. Being worn, unironically, or ironically? Being, uh, uh, being worn, unironically, uh, at, at, at the vape shop. I got a picture of them on my phone. Sick. They're expensive now to try to get some old ones. I bet. I bet. A fee man is a woman who thinks and acts like a man because she believes it makes her equal to men. So, if you are a yeah. woman and you are getting too uppity, don't be thinking that you're equal to men. Don't be acting is, like a female. Is this like the uh, the girl that you know? Not I'm just in general, and I'm not talking about anybody specific, but the girl that everybody knows at a certain point that all her friends was guys, and she was just one of the guys, and all these guys are like my brothers. I like to do guy stuff with them. That's that's probably who he's talking about. I, I can drink like a man, and we'll go fishing, and I don't have any girlfriends because I don't like them. I just like hanging out with the guys. I know who he's talking about. I'm feeling you. Please don't sexually abuse guy. me. I'm one of you. I'm one of I'm you one guys. Of you. That's what it is. That's what it is. Get too uppity. Don't be a fee man. Rock free. This term uh, is any man who attends a church with a woman pastor. I didn't. Even though the women could be pastors, um, I'm not sure what churches they can be. I've never even heard of that. Was that a thing? Yeah, yeah. I, there, there are certain denominations that don't allow it. Um, many of the Protestant, probably most of the Protestant denominations allow it. Outside they of like Catholic, it? huh? They do allow it. Yeah, yeah, they allow. It. Oh. Like Catholics don't. Uh, uh, some of like the weirder. Protestant sects, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons. Mormons just started letting black people be uh, deacons at their church, so they're like not even close to women yet. <laughs> like seriously, they didn't allow them up until the seventies. Like seventy. What did Jesus say about black people? What the hell? They didn't exist back then, James. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> uh, well, the uh, dark skin was a, a curse. It's the curse of Ham. These are the the children of. Cain, yeah, they they betrayed God's word and God cursed them with dark skin. I don't think that's why. I, that's weird. I never heard that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Interesting the theory. It's 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 the line of Ham is what it is in the Bible. The line of Ham, uh, they sided against God, and uh, he he cursed their lineage with dark skin so that they would forever be marked amongst us God fearing people with complexions like mine. <laughs> Quite a religion you got there, guys. <laughs> All right, mixed nuts. Mixed nuts is any man who claims Christ, but is actively involved in homosexual activity. So, like most televangelists, probably yes, I would assume so. Um, so, also every Catholic priest, probably right. <laughs> yes, of course. Pedophilia and homosexuality in their in their case. Um, yeah. Jesus. And finally, the homoerotic huddle. This is any men's group where, where the men cry inordinately and hug each other with deep affection. Any men's group where the men cry inordinately and hug each other with deep affection is a homoerotic huddle that Mark Driscoll condemned on a message board under the pseudonym William Wallace. Where's he hanging out? Mark like, Driscoll or William Wallace? Uh... Mark, yeah, just I, I don't know. I've I've never been around that. I just there's always like a, a bit of a fit, fixation on uh, sexuality, and, and in particular with these male preachers like homosexuality and homoeroticism, and 
men pretending yeah, they think to be a lot like about women. this, don't they? <laughs> they think a lot about it. It's just weird. It's probably just a coincidence. I'm sure there's nothing. Probably there. a coincidence, yeah. Probably a coincidence. It's just, it's just odd. I've just never thought that much about it myself. <laughs> I've never had a reason to. Well, here's an example. Here is an example of a um, homoerotic huddle in action, of course. Jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Ritten, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? Is there anyone who does not agree with the verdicts as read? No. Would you wish the jury pulled? No. Okay. Uh, okay, folks, you're... Uh, Seems like a lot of and, inordinate uh, crying and hugging going on. A lot of on. crying. Just about three weeks ago. And I uh, caught, I told you it. Homo erotic huddle. I'm mm. calling it. Get yourself together, Kyle. I was going to call Chris Kyle. That's wrong, wrong Here's, Here, Kyle, this is for you, buddy. How dare you! <laughs> <laughs> Don't you ever touch another man like that. <laughs> Very angry. He's yelling at the he's yelling at the women getting too uppity. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? I love it. Who has who has a better How dare you? Mark Driscoll or Greta Thunberg? Uh, what's the Greta Thunberg one? I don't know what that one is. How dare you? How dare you? There it is. Young people for hope. How dare you? Oh, no, no, hang on, hang on. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words, and yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People Is this from the, uh, from COP25 or whatever? Dying. Entire uh, some, some climate change. We are in the beginning of a mass Donald extinction, meeting. and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic I haven't growth. watched this. It's pretty, pretty How moving. Dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Yeah. Throws him. How dare you, Zen? Really good. Yeah, the Climate Action Summit. For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you're doing enough? Every right wing media host hated her. She was really? Hitler. She was Hitler. What? You listen to Sean Hannity? All right, man. Been a blast. Uh, appreciate right. you coming on the show. Oh, I, the, well, I don't know if we'd be able to watch that. I put another video up here at the top where. Uh, oh, okay. I don't know if you've seen this or not, and it's almost definitely. I don't know if it'd be copyright. Probably copyrighted, but I whatever. can cut it out. Yeah, but on the televangelist thing, uh, I, this is what I initially thought of. Yeah, this guy. I remember this guy too. Um, Kenneth Copeland. When I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen this video? No. All right, just skip forward just a, just a hair. All right, yeah, just we'll let it. Now go ahead back where you were. This is uh, Andrea on Tunis. He's, he's great. Exercise judgment right now. Because we in have. In the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's so good, man. It's so good. It's not cut either. He's got a whole series of these where he's like different <laughs> televangelists and like just cr people going nuts on TV, and he just adds like a metal soundtrack to it, and it's God. it's fantastic. This is like what's in my head when I'm fucking going crazy or some shit. I feel like I'm going crazy <laughs> watching this. Very weird. So good. Interesting though. Anyways, all right. Yep. Uh, good talking to you. I guess I'll see you next week. I'll see you later, man. Have a good one. Peace. Peace. Peace.